conflict is a part of life. If you have two people, there's potential for conflict. Any relationship, every age group, among every group of people, even among Christians, there is potential for conflict. It's less about whether there's going to be conflict and it's more about how we respond to conflict. We saw last week as we looked at Paul and Barnabas coming back from their first missionary journey, they were faced with conflict. There were Jewish believers that were saying that salvation is through the law and not through grace. There was conflict and they handled it spiritually and they went, ended up going to Jerusalem and the council at Jerusalem and grace was upheld. We are saved by grace through faith. And that conflict made way for the truth to be strengthened. It made way for them to grow and be unified. So again, it's not the fact that, that conflict will or won't happen. It will happen. It's how we respond and it's how we let God move through that conflict. And as we continue looking at Paul and Barnabas, we see after they get back from Jerusalem that they're getting ready to go on the second missionary journey. And as Lee said, this is where we see another conflict. Now, this is not a conflict over the law. It's not a conflict from, from, from Jewish believers that are wanting to go back to, to legalism. No, this is a conflict between Paul and Barnabas. And to this point, we've seen this dynamic duo being greatly effective for the kingdom of God. I mean, they face persecution together and Jesus was exalted. They go and they face opposition. They face being, being beat and stoned and together they pursued Christ and we saw the lost come to Jesus. We saw grace upheld. There was an amazing presence of God in these two men. But then at the end of Acts chapter five, we see this conflict unfold. So let's go ahead and look at this. Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 41. 36 through 41. Some time later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to do the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. What happened? What happened? They were both unified in ministry. They were both unified in the mission and the message of Jesus Christ. And then conflict hits. Now, Barnabas wanted to take his cousin, John Mark. And John Mark had went with them on the first missionary journey. But as Lee pointed out, John Mark deserted them and went back to Jerusalem. Now, did he have reason? You could say, well, maybe, you know, afraid of being stoned by people wanting to kill you, afraid of the violence. We don't know why he went back. But Paul chose the key word, deserted them and then did not join them again. So John, Barnabas wants to give John Mark another chance, but we see Saul not wanting to risk the mission and message, not want to risk the, the spreading of the gospel, and he doesn't want him to go. This disagreement was so volatile that they decided to go separate ways. This disagreement was so volatile, we do not see Paul writing about Barnabas at any point in any of his further letters. We do not see them crossing paths or co-laboring in ministry anymore. This was a major, major disagreement. Now, an obvious lesson from this incident is that we can understand that 
any relationship can go sour even for the best of us. There is no relationship that is exempt from conflict. But we need to understand that the person we have the conflict with, they are not the enemy. They are not the enemy. There is actual enemy, and he is the devil, and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy, right? He wants to take what God brings together. He wants to take the unity of the body. He wants to take the message of Jesus and completely divide it based upon disagreement, hurt, feelings, and conflict. And we see here that there is a separation. And again, Paul could not say, well, John, Mark, or Barnabas are the enemy, and vice versa. John, Mark, and Barnabas couldn't say, well, that dirty Paul. You know, No, the enemy is the devil. And in our conflicts, we have to understand that the only enemy is the one who stands in opposition of Jesus Christ, and that is the devil. Now, with that, we also have to understand that we all see things differently. And conflict is a part of or a potential for every relationship, all you have to do is look at marriage and immediately go, men and women see things differently. They process things differently. There's potential for conflict. You get two people together, not everybody processes things the same way. Conflict is a potential. And the devil is waiting because he wants to capitalize on that. But my challenge to you is, is again, not that we face conflict because we do, but how we respond. Because there's two ways. There is the natural or the way of the world, the flesh, and that will lead us away from God, but there's also the spiritual one. Now, to understand the natural one, a lot of times we learn our response to conflict from our family. If your mom and dad responded to conflict in a certain way, there's a good chance you carried some of those attributes, okay? It could be the fact that you are aggressive and you go on attack. It could be that you withdraw, put up walls, don't forgive. Whatever that default response that you learned from life or from family, you have to understand that there is a natural response which is not God's will, and then there is a spiritual response that is God's will. How do we respond to conflict? What I'd like to do is I would like for us to be able to look at three responses. Three responses that God desires for his church. No matter how deep the pain, no matter how strong the conflict, there's three responses that God is calling us towards in regards to conflict. If you have your bulletins, follow along. The first is this. Christians are to resolve conflict in a biblical manner. Not in a manner that they see fit, not in a manner that that's how my mom and dad did it, not in a manner that's what that person deserves, in a biblical manner. God's word is the authority of our lives, and we need to see God's direction. And the first thing to understand comes from what Paul wrote later when he's writing to the believers in Ephesus. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27 the first response to conflict is to resolve it quickly. Quickly. This is what Paul writes. He says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. And see, what happens is, is there is a conflict and we're like, oh, I don't want to deal with this. I've got so much going on. I will just put it over here. I'll just put it over here. And then here comes another conflict. Oh, I don't want to deal with it. You know, we've got this going on. This person, they're hard to deal with. We put it over here. And what ends up happening is that becomes a collective baggage that doesn't go away. There's no such thing in conflict as sweeping it under the rug and having it be healthy or spiritual. That's not healthy or spiritual because it eventually will consume you, right? It's very similar to what happened when I was in Greenfield and we were, we were in a parsonage there and there was a period of time that the shower wasn't draining. And I'm not the handiest person, but 
I'm also smart enough to figure out that, okay, maybe something has clogged the drain. So I take the, take the little cap thing off, and, and I, I, get, I get a screwdriver, and I'm trying to get things out of there. And, and oh, my goodness, I was not prepared for what was in there. I have no clue how long this had been building up. It was the biggest glob of gook. I have ever seen, and it smelled. I mean, the oh, it was so gross. And I'm not kidding. It was like this big, this long, and I'm digging it out, and it's like, it's still coming. And oh, I'm going to get sick. And the thing was, is this happened because it was allowed to build up. You know, one little glob of gloop there, you know, was didn't satisfy, so it just kept on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm surprised anything got down that drain, and eventually, I got it all out, and halfway sick, taking it out to the trash, but how many times does that happen in our relationships? We don't deal with things in a spiritual way. We don't deal with things quickly to invite Jesus into it, and then it becomes this big glob of gunk. I think if we look past in our life, there's a lot of relationships that we've allowed that to happen. And what happens is that we're responding outside of the authority of Jesus Christ. Because as soon as there's a conflict, a disagreement, a hurt feeling, whatever, we need to invite Jesus in. Because what happens when we don't is, first of all, it builds up. Second of all, what does Paul say if we do, if we let the sun go down before we deal with anger or hurt feelings or whatever? Who gets a foothold? Satan. He says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Because that will give Satan a foothold. And so not only do we have this big old smelly gob of blah, But then we invite Satan in because we've asked Jesus to step out. Church, this is is serious. This is serious. And and I'll be honest, I'm not up here saying, I've done this right every time. Because I haven't. And I've had to walk this out. But it's when we continually submit it to Jesus Christ and don't let it build up and don't let the enemy have a foothold. That's when we can move forward towards reconciliation, healing, and have that relationship find Christ at the center. So that's first. Invite Jesus in quickly and completely. The second thing we see in Scripture comes from what Jesus said in Matthew 18, 15. Matthew 18, 15 says this. If your brother sins against you, your brother or sister in Christ, this is a Christ, these are Christian and Christian relationships. If a brother or sister in Christ sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. And so not only do we re- invite Jesus in quickly and completely, but we do it personally, one-on-one. Someone doesn't offend us and we go and grab all of our friends together and go, did you, they did this to me. I can't believe they did this. And then we start talking to people or then we get on social media and we say something like, oh, don't you hate it when someone does this to you, but you don't say their name. That's called passive aggressive. That's not good, right? And so we don't do that. Jesus says, go face to face to the person. And you go face to face, not to go and tell them off. You go with a heart to reconcile. You go with a heart to make sure the enemy's out and that Jesus is in the middle. I believe, I'm convinced, if Christians took this one step to say, I'm going to that person with a heart to resolve, with a heart to to forgive and to have Christ there and to keep the enemy out. If we took this one step, it would solve so many of the conflicts that we have in the church and among Christians. This one step, start there. My heart is to reconcile. My heart is to be humbled. My heart is to restore Christ in the relationship. Now, Jesus goes on because if you go to that person and the person doesn't receive it, 
If you go to that person and it is not reconciled by that one-on-one face-to-face, Jesus then goes on to say in verses um, 16 through 18, he says, but if the person will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So again, what Jesus is saying, if someone has sinned against you, if there's conflict in between you, go to that person with a heart, with a desire, to bring this to Christ and to reconcile. If that does not work, get one or two people to come with you. Now, this is not getting your posse so you can go all gangsta. This is not getting your group of people to say, come because we are gonna totally attack them. No, you get two or three people with the same heart of love for that person and the same love and obedience to Christ and you go with those people with the heart to reconcile. If that does not work, you submit it to the church. You submit it to the leaders of the church. You submit it to the church. If that person then at that point still rejects Christ's reconciliation, it says treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, what Jesus is saying here is at this point, you need to create a relational divide because they need to feel the weight of that broken fellowship. And when you, you're not creating, you're not treating them like a pagan because, because you're not forgiving them. No, you're 100% saying, God, this relationship's yours. I forgive him. I give up all bitterness. But you're giving them fully to the ministry of the spirit and the weight of broken fellowship so that, so that prayerfully, hopefully, they will eventually return and come to be restored. And at that point, you're ready. You're ready to receive them. That separation is not because you have a a heart that is guarded. No, it's to give them fully to God. So what we see here scripturally, we see two things that quickly, quickly invite Christ in. Second, personally, with the help of strong believers present this before the Lord and prayerfully, hopefully, that will bring reconciliation. The second spiritual response to conflict is this. Christians need to be willing to relinquish our rights. We need to be willing to relinquish our rights. Now, I'm not talking about biblical truth. I'm not talking about compromising biblical truth or being able to, to you know, just let somebody else win when they're, when they're wrong. No, this means our emotions, our feelings, how we were offended, our opinion, the fact that we said, oh, well, I think we went to this restaurant on the third Sunday in 1972. No, I think we went to this. It's, who cares? That doesn't matter. We have to be willing to give up our rights to be right, give up our rights to our feelings, give up our rights to the offense because unity in Christ is greater than us. Harmony, peace in the body is more important than someone hurting our feelings. Now, I'm not trying to water that down. It hurts, but you submit it. You submit it to Christ. You make it not about you, but it's about the lordship of Christ in your life. The Apostle Paul addressed this in regards to the church in Corinth. This is a good example of of giving up your rights so that Christ is Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 7, what was happening here is that the church in Corinth had lots of issues. And one of those was that some of the Corinthian Christians felt their business or personal rights were violated by other believers, so they took it to a Roman court. They were taking them to court. They were suing them. And this is what Paul writes. 1 Corinthians 6, 7, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you 
means you have been completely defeated already. Because they took it out of Christ. They removed Christ and they brought in a secular court to solve what should have been resolved between brothers and sisters in Christ. And then he goes on. He says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? We have so many people, Christians, that fight over property, land, fight over just I'm right, you're wrong, my feelings. When you match those things up to what Christ did on the cross, they mean nothing. They mean nothing. The only thing that matters is Jesus. And if we step outside of Jesus as the center of our relationship, Jesus as Lord, we are totally losing who we are all for the sake of some right that we feel like we have. Jesus, Jesus is all that matters. Jesus even showed us the example, as as Lee talked about, where God ultimately showed us the response to conflict when we were sinners, we were enemies, that he sent Jesus to die for us. Jesus' very life is an example of how you, how you lay down your rights so that there can be unity. This is what the Apostle Paul reveals in Philippians 2, 3 through 7. This is Jesus' example, and he says, have this same attitude, starting verse 3. Don't be selfish. That right there will resolve 90% of conflict. Don't be selfish, right? And then, don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, took the humble position of a slave, born as a human being when he appeared in human form. Jesus laid down his life. And that's how we should love each other. Jesus even referred to this in John 13, 34. He says, as I have loved you, that's the measure you should love each other. Not how the world loves, not how you feel like you should love, not what you think is fair. No, love as Jesus has loved us. The ultimate expression of this is found in forgiveness. The very definition of forgiveness speaks to this. The very definition. Forgiveness literally means to release our rights to an offense. Release our rights. What that means is that we release our right to dwell on it. We release our right to hold it against the person. We release our right to keep bringing it up. And the question is why? Because that's what Jesus did for us. That's what Jesus did for us. Look at the measure to we are are to forgive others of what Paul writes in Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. How are you supposed to forgive someone to the same measure that God forgave you through Jesus Christ? We give up our rights because we have been redeemed, purchased by Jesus Christ. We don't hold any rights over our feelings. We don't determine when and how we forgive someone. Jesus does that. And Jesus says, forgive as I have forgiven you. Now, I'm going to say this with complete honesty. This is humanly impossible. Believe me, I've tried to forgive people in my own love and in my own strength and in my own discernment. And every time it falls short, the only way we can forgive someone by giving up our rights is when we make it all about Jesus. Now that doesn't give the person authority or power over you to forgive them. It actually gives Jesus the rightful place. The very one that canceled our wrongs canceled our sin is calling us 
to give every offense to him. We don't hold on to it any longer. And that is only through the power of Jesus Christ at work in people who lay everything before him. We need to give up our rights so that Jesus is the authority. The third thing that we see, the last spiritual response to conflict, is Christians need to rebound and move forward in Christ. Rebound and move forward in Christ. There's no question the Apostle Paul was not proud of what happened with him and John, Mark, and Barnabas. He, this was not something that he went and bragged about. Boy, I gave Barney the what for, you know. I made him go the other direction. He was not proud about this. This was a place that I know the Holy Spirit was working heavy upon his heart and his mind. But Paul did not let conflict define him. He did, not conf- he did not allow conflict to defeat him. He did not allow this opposition with Barnabas to be something that took him off path of where God was leading. Because we can read through chapter 16 and we can see that Paul was 100% led by the Holy Spirit. He was 100% on the mission and message of Jesus. He was 100% going and advancing the gospel. He had to move forward from conflict. Too many people allow broken relationships to break them and ruin what God is wanting to do. I had a situation in... When Jane and I were first married, a best friend, um, he was the best man at my wedding. I mean, we, 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 were, we were always together, the closest friends. And it was so funny because he was like 6'6", six, six, and I'm just a little guy, and he had muscle, and I don't. And we were the opposites, but we were so close. We were always together. And after, after we got married and we both started having kids and, and I remember pursuing him and, and, and saying, let's seek God together. Let, let, let's be the best fathers we can be for our kids. Let's be the best husbands. And then honestly, I don't know what happened. He stopped returning my phone calls. I, I tried to meet with him and, and we wouldn't meet. He didn't show up. And I wish I could say, you know what, church, this is what happened. But I don't know. Because he pulled away so deep that it was never restored. And it would be easy. And honestly, there's times I wanted to say, I'm done with friends. I'm done. I'm done with people who say they love Jesus and I don't want to be hurt like that anymore. It would have been easy to do that. It would have been easy to say, nope, no more. I'm not going to make myself vulnerable. I'm not going to invite anybody in. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to guard my heart. I'm going to put up a wall and I'm going to keep people out. That's how bad it hurt. But my life is not my own. My emotions, my offenses, my opinions were completely redeemed by Jesus on the cross. And so I only have one choice, Jesus. And I had to be able to forgive him and love him even though I never had the chance to find out what happened. I had to move forward. And that's what we see Paul doing. Paul could have easily said, I'm done with the missionary journeys. I am done with working with anybody. I'm out of here. The law was better. I'm going back to that because I can use that as a measuring stick to smack people around with. But Paul knew that Jesus set him free. And this conflict was not going to define him. And he was going to move forward with the mission and message of Jesus because that was all that mattered. Now, we see that there was some reconciliation. We don't know what happened with his relationship with Barnabas. We do know that he saw value in John Mark. And we do know that. And the last letter that he writes before he's killed, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4.11, Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. Paul moved forward. 
He didn't let the conflict define him. He didn't let the disappointment and the hurt feelings, he didn't let it define him. He moved forward. And as Paul writes in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. And the reality is, is we have a responsibility to respond to Jesus. We can't make the other person respond by inviting Jesus into the conflict, but we need to be faithful. And there's sometimes relationships will not continue on. And we have to be okay to love that person anyway and move forward pursuing Christ. Paul went on and we see in chapter 16 that Paul allowed God to do amazing things. The conflict didn't end. Matter of fact, he, goes, he and Silas goes into um, next towns and, and this pattern where they, people reject the gospel. They are actually flogged. That's where their skin is ripped off. They are beaten, they are put in prison, and they are chained, and there's a jailer standing there. But you know what they did? They did not allow that conflict to beat them down. They did not allow that conflict, they did not allow the trials to steal what Christ was doing. They actually worshiped. They worshiped God. They prayed. And we see that the prison doors were flung open by an earthquake. The chains came off. And you know what most of us would have done? We would immediately grab that jailer and say, yeah, you want to flog something, flog this. You know, we would have. Sorry, <laughs> that was a little build up there. <laughs> no, but what did they do? What did Paul do when the chains came off? What did Paul do? He shared the power of God with that jailer. And the very jailer, you talk about conflict, have somebody flog you and see, see how you're feeling. We get upset because someone didn't talk to us. Flogged him, beat him. And Paul invites Jesus in the middle and the power of Jesus that can overcome any conflict, the power of Jesus that can overcome any divide, Paul ends up baptizing that jailer and his family. That's someone who moved forward in Christ. Will you let conflict define you? Will you respond to it as the world responds? Will you respond to it as you were taught? Or will you respond to it by allowing Jesus to be Savior and Lord and seeking Him and allowing Him to move and allow Him to change your heart and forgive and allow that other person to see God's love and grace as you forgive them? Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, 13 and 14 says, but one thing I do, forget what is behind, string toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We will have conflict, but may we always place Jesus in the rightful place and see that other person through the victory of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ and the Lordship of Christ. That's when we're the church. That's when we're the church.